Hello, welcome to Get Smart in Science. Here we're going to explain what an orbit is, and I have a few key questions that I want to point out to you that we're going to answer here, and the goal is to take something seemingly complicated and break it down so that it's understandable in only a few minutes. First things we're going to talk about is how does an orbit work. We're going to talk about how orbits can exist and go on and on forever seemingly without stopping. We're going to talk about why astronauts uh, seem to be weightless when they're in orbit and how does a spacecraft enter in orbit and stay the same. And along the way we'll talk a little bit about a history of orbits and uh, kind of the evolution of those ideas. So the first thing here is we all know that we have the Sun at the center of the solar system, right? That's what we know today in the 21st century. And the planets go around uh, the Sun. So here we have Mercury, Venus, here's Earth with the Moon there, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Now Pluto has a little bit different looking orbit, but effectively all of these look like to be circular orbits. And that's kind of what we know to be the case today. So now we want to break this down a little bit further. Here's the graphic from before. We know that planets orbit the sun. The sun's at the center. It's really, really massive, and all of these planets seem to go around the sun. Now, if we zoom in on the Earth moon system, we can see that the Earth is kind of at the center, and the moon orbits around the Earth. So here we have the sun and all the planets going around it, and if we zoom in, we have the Earth with the moon going around it. And of course, if you look at Jupiter and Saturn and almost all of these other planets, you'll see that they all have moons kind of going around around in orbits around each of those planets as well. Now if you zoom in even further, any spacecraft, satellite, space station, anything like that, that's in orbit around the Earth is going around and around the Earth, the Earth itself. So just like the Moon goes around and around the Earth, all satellites, whether they're weather satellites, uh, space shuttles, space stations, they're always in motion. They're always going around the Earth uh, in an orbit. Now to really blow your mind a little bit, if you zoom out, you see, uh, this is the Andromeda galaxy. If you zoom out, in the center of almost every galaxy that we know of, there is a supermassive black hole. You can't see it here because it's obscured by all the stars and dust in the way, but there's usually a supermassive black hole in the center of almost every galaxy we know of, and every one of these stars here, going all the way around this galaxy, they're in motion orbiting the galactic center. So it's kind of neat because you have the planets going around the sun, and the moons going around the planets, and if you zoom out far enough, you see that all of the stars and all of the solar systems and all of the galaxies are rotating around their galactic center as well. So orbits are really, really important. In fact, it seems like everything is orbiting something in the universe. So on our way to understanding how orbits work, I want to talk a little bit about a brief history. It's just really fascinating how humanity kind of figured this stuff out. So in 1543, a really important person, Nicholas Copernicus, who lived between these years, he published a book explaining how the sun was at the center of the solar system and that the planets actually moved around the sun. Now you have to remember, this was a mind-blowing idea because before this time period, everyone pretty much assumed that the Earth was the center of everything and everything in the sky moved around us. But Copernicus, along with a few other contemporaries, started to formulate this idea that the sun was actually at the center. They didn't really understand all the math involved, but they knew and they suspected that it was at the center. Now, from 1543 coming up to 1609, another person, Johannes Kepler, who lived between these years, 1571 to 1630, um, he observed uh, the night sky and he published his very famous Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion, which we still use today. So you can see, you know, four, 450 years ago, uh, this person developed something that's actually being used today, right? The, the Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion. And the there's a, a lot to that. I could have a whole lesson on that, but basically the most important thing that he discovered was that the orbit of the planets really aren't circles. In fact, the previous pictures I showed you, they look circular. They're really not circles. They're actually ellipses. So they're elliptical orbits. So a circle looks like this, of course, and an ellipse looks more like an oval, like an egg shape. All right, so the orbit of Earth, for example, is actually an ellipse. It's very slightly eccentric like this. It looks very close to circular at a glance, but if you really study it, it's very slightly elliptical. Now comets, on the other hand, that we see come into our solar system from time to time, they have very highly elliptical orbits. But most of the planets, Pluto is the big exception, of course it's a dwarf planet now, most of the planets have orbits that are elliptical but very closely look like a circle. 
Now, continuing on the line here, we had Copernicus saying the sun was the center of the solar system, and Johannes Kepler saying, hey, these planets orbit in ellipses, which can look similar to circles uh, going around the sun. Uh, some years later, in 1687, the famous Isaac Newton, which I know you've heard of, who lived between these years and uh, up to 1726, published his very famous law of gravitation, which, again, we still use today. And the big thing about it, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what his law of gravitation really is, but the, the takeaway from it is this right here. He basically used his law of gravity to correctly predict, using math, that the orbit of the planets always follow an elliptical path. So whereas Kepler looked at the night sky and figured out that the planets must be moving in ellipses, um, Isaac Newton developed a theory of gravity and an equation that describes gravitational force, and he used that equation to, again, predict that all the planets should move that way. So he knew he was on the right path and that his law of gravity must be pretty close to being correct because he used his law of gravity to predict how the planets actually move in real life. Now here's where things get interesting. We're going to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about Newton's law of gravity. Now there's a lot of stuff on the page here, so don't worry too much about absorbing it all at once. Let's take it one step at a time. Basically what Newton said is that everything that has mass in the universe, whether it's a planet or a peanut or a tree, they all exert a gravitational force on everything else in the universe. And that gravitational force is calculated or can be calculated by this equation. Now, I'm not going to do a bunch of calculations here, but I do want you to know that there's an equation that exists that Isaac Newton developed, and this is basically what it is. So the illustration here, you can see M1 just means mass number one. So this could, for instance, be the Earth. And this could, for instance, be a space station or a moon. Let's call it the moon. That's we all know going around the Earth, but forget about the fact that it's orbiting Earth. It's just some moon out there, right? So what Newton's law is basically saying, gravitational law is saying, that there's a force that exists between these two things just because they have mass and just because we live in this universe where gravity exists. So if you look at it here, this mass here is pulling on this moon with some force. We call it F2. It's pulling at this direction, right? Because gravitational force is attractive. And then, of course, we have this moon here also pulling on the Earth. So Gravity always kind of works in pairs like that. Each body is pulling on the other one, right? So let's go down this list, and I'll talk a little bit more about the equation. Newton's law of gravity basically says that all objects with mass attract each other, everything, whether it's a peanut, a bumblebee, a bulldozer, a planet, a black hole. If it has mass, it always has this attractive force we call the gravitational force. Number two, gravity is always attractive. That means that gravity never repulses. We never have repelling bodies pushing away from each other due to gravity. You know, unlike magnetism, magnetism can, can repel as well, but gravity is always attractive, and that's interesting. Now, this G here in this equation that we'll talk about in a second, it's just a gravitational constant of our universe. It's a, just a number. So when you do this calculation, G here is just a number. It might as well be 4. It, it's not really 4, but it's a number if I were teaching you how to calculate it, I would give you the, what the number actually is, but for now, just think of G as being a number. Now, the force, the gravitational force that you're calculating between two objects depends on this gravitational constant, and it also depends on the mass of the Earth, in this case, mass of body number one, multiplied by the mass of body number two, which you can consider it to be the moon, but it could be anything uh, in the universe that's, that you're calculating the force between. And it also is divided by or depending on r. r is just simply the distance between the two objects. But notice it's not dependent on r, it's dependent on r squared, which if you remember back a little bit of algebra, if you don't, it's not a big deal, but basically r squared means r times r, r times itself. So the takeaway from this famous law of gravitation is that it allows us to calculate the force between any two bodies in the universe. If we know the mass of body number one, in this case, call it the Earth, since we're talking about orbits. And we know the mass of body number two. Uh, in this case, it could be you know, the moon or a spaceship. And we know the distance between them. Then all we do is we put in the mass of body one times the mass of body two. We divide by the distance between them squared. So we have to multiply the distance times itself, times the distance, distance times distance. And we do this division, because this is a fraction, and then we multiply by this gravitational constant, and out comes a number. And that is how much attractive force exists between these two objects.
Now again, these are any two objects. This could be the Earth and the Moon. This could be the Sun, and this could be the Earth. This could be the Sun. This could be Pluto. Any object you want. Stick the masses in there, the distance, the gravitational constant, and out comes a force between them. So the force depends on the mass of each object and the distance r between them. Now, this is an interesting takeaway as well. If you increase the mass of either one of these objects, right, then the gravitational force increases because you're multiplying these together. So if you increase the mass, the gravitational force is higher. That makes sense because the gravitational force of Jupiter is higher than the gravitational force of Earth. That's because Jupiter's mass is much bigger. Now, if you increase the distance between two objects, you're increasing the number on the bottom here squared, then because it's on the bottom of a fraction, if you make this big, the gravitational force goes down really, really, really fast. So the takeaway from this is Newton developed a law of gravitation allowing us to calculate the force between two objects that depends only on their masses and the distance between them squared times this constant here. Now here's where we start to put all the pieces together and talk about actually orbits. Because everybody's seen a rocket, right? Like this is a space shuttle, it launches up into the sky. But if everything is pulling straight down on everything else, uh, as we showed in the previous picture, then if we launch rockets straight up, why don't they come crashing down? In other words, if we have a rocket here on Earth and it's launching straight up away from Earth, why doesn't it just stop and then just come right back down and crash? into the Earth. There has to be more to it than just launching a rocket up. And in fact, there is more to it, and we'll talk about that here in the next second. The answer to this question is that we do initially launch the rockets straight up, but almost immediately we actually turn all rockets towards the horizon and accelerate uh, really, really fast horizontally. In, in other words, in order to actually get into orbit, which we'll talk about in just a second, you need to have a really fast horizontal velocity. So these pictures show that. These are time-lapse pictures of rocket launches. So you can see the rocket does start straight up, but if it were to continue straight up like this, it would eventually run out of gas and stop, and it would come right back down and hit the Earth. But of course, that's not what we're doing. As soon as we launch, it starts to curve, and it starts to accelerate and bend over and starts to go horizontal to the horizon. And you can see that in this picture here, and that is what allows spaceships, spacecraft to enter orbit. Here's another picture of a different rocket launch. You can see it a little more clearly. We don't launch straight up. That's the answer. We actually start, and then we bend over, and we go horizontal. That is the key to all of this orbital uh, mechanics that we're studying here. So here's where the rubber meets the road and where we're going to finally explain all of this stuff. Again, if we just launched a rocket straight up, then it would just stop and it would come right back down and hit the Earth. But we don't. We actually go more towards the horizon. So in order to kind of illustrate this a little bit more, I'm going to show you and say I am a person standing here on the top of the Earth and I have a smiley face, okay? And I have, a, let's say, a gun with me, or let's say a slingshot with me. Now, I'm going to take and I'm going to aim that uh, slingshot, let's say, horizontally. But in this case, it's just going to be a very slow speed. It's just like a slingshot, very slow, you know, um, velocity that I'm, that I'm shooting at that. If I were to shoot a slingshot horizontally at slow speed, then eventually gravity would take it and pull it down. Now, this is exaggerated, but you can kind of see what's going to happen. If I shoot it horizontally slowly, everybody knows eventually things just fall to the ground because gravity is pulling down. I can do this in a different color. Gravity is actually pulling down all along this path because of the gravitational force that Newton calculated. So everywhere along its path, it's being pulled down, down, down. Eventually, the thing is going to hit the ground. Okay. Now that's for a low speed, so with a slingshot. Now let's go over here and say we have a rifle, a high-powered rifle that we use. So I have, again, Jason standing here at the top of the earth, like this, and I'm going to shoot it at a medium speed. So I'm going to take this guy, and I'm going to shoot it horizontally at a medium speed, really, really fast. It's still going to hit the earth, right, because the gravitational force is, again, pulling down straight to the center of the earth everywhere along the way, everywhere along its path. But because the thing is actually moving faster, it just can get farther around the planet before it actually hits the ground. But again, it still hits the ground. So you can kind of see what's happening here. When we have a slow speed, it, it hits the ground pretty quick. If we shoot it faster, it gets halfway around the planet before it actually hits the ground. Now here's the punchline here. What we're going to have in this case is I'm again going to be standing at the top of the earth, happily, with my smiley face. But instead of a rock, and instead of a rifle or a slingshot, I'm going to use a rocket. So I'm going to shoot this thing really, really fast horizontally. And when I do that, 
the earth is still going to be pulling me down. But because I'm shooting this thing with a rocket, which can go very, very, very fast, what's basically happening is that, uh, and again, my drawing's not so great, but again, I'm falling down all the way around the planet, but I never actually hit the ground, only because I'm going so fast that I, I kind of match the curvature of the earth. So it's important for you to know this, that every step along the way, the earth is still pulling down on this rocket or this projectile that I have fired there. It's still pulling down on it. Gravity never ever goes away. That's what people think. You go to space and there's no gravity. That's not true. Gravity is still here. It's still pulling down on you. It's just that you're going so fast horizontally, just like before, with a little bit of speed you hit the ground here, with a little bit more speed you hit the ground over here, with really fast speed you hit the ground somewhere over here. If you can go fast enough, you'll just never hit the ground and you'll just keep going uh, in a circle there. So that's what we call an orbit. Now to reach orbit, two things have to happen. You need to be high enough above the atmosphere so that you don't have any drag. Because if you do have drag, it's going to slow you down and you eventually will then hit the ground. So you need to be above the air, basically. And you have to have a very high horizontal velocity so that you'll never hit the ground. Essentially, this is the punchline of this whole set of lessons here. You just need to go fast enough horizontally and high enough to be above the drag so that you never hit the ground, but you are falling around the earth the entire time. So here what I want to do is go back to our original questions I started out with. There were four of them. The first one is how do orbits work? Now we've answered that. Basically gravity is always pulling down. If I were to, to launch a rocket up, it would come straight down. Or if I were to go and just drop an apple out here, it would just fall down. Gravity is always pulling us down. So in order to get into orbit, we need to launch up but then bend over and go as fast as we can horizontally so that we can match the curvature of the Earth like this and we'll never hit the ground. That's what basically an orbit actually is. The second question we had was how can a spacecraft be in orbit uh, be in orbital motion, quote unquote, forever. And what I mean by that is basically orbits, you, you think that they never really stop. I mean, the planets have been going around the sun forever and ever. Basically, once you're above the atmosphere, there's no drag. So there's no slowing down because there's no air up here. But in reality, the Earth has an atmosphere and it doesn't really just stop up here. It's very, very tenuous. It's very, very light up here. So in reality, where space stations and satellites travel, there is a little bit of air. So eventually that air will very very, very slowly slow you down. And if you slow yourself down, you will then drop out of orbit and hit the ground, right? So real satellites and real spaceships need to periodically reboost themselves and get it, get back up higher just to get it above the air. That's just to get above the drag of the atmosphere. But effectively, once you get above that drag of the atmosphere, or in the case of the planets, you're, you're not in really the atmosphere of the sun anymore, you really do go on forever because there's nothing to slow you down anymore. Now here's one of my favorite questions. People say, why are astronauts weightless when they're in orbit? And people mostly say, well, there's no gravity. Well, I've been trying to tell you this over and over again. There's always gravity. If you're in a spaceship up here, it's always trying to pull you down. So the question is, if you always have gravity, then why are they floating inside of their spaceship? In order to understand that, you need to think about an elevator shaft. So here's a very tall elevator shaft. You can see the bottom down here. Imagine yourself in an elevator, right? So imagine a really, 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 really tall elevator shaft miles and miles and miles tall and inside of it you have an elevator right now you have a, a cord and you cut it right so you just start free falling and you're inside of this thing and you're like wee like this going down what's going to happen well initially as soon as the the line is cut you're going to feel it in your in your stomach you're going to feel that 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 sensation of weightlessness there are no windows in this elevator you can't see that you're actually falling if you had a very tall elevator, let's say 10 miles high or 20 miles high, eventually what's going to happen is that you're going to start floating kind of inside of this elevator because the elevator is going to be traveling down and you're going to be traveling down with it basically at the same speed. You're going to be falling at the same speed as the elevator. So once you get over the butterflies, you're going to be kind of floating around in here because the elevator is going to be going down but you are going to be going down basically at the same speed. So from your point of view inside the elevator, you're just going to kind of float around because you're both moving at the same speed down. Now that's what's happening in the rocket. You're, you launch up, and we've been saying over and over again that you're falling around the Earth, and you really are falling. You're being attracted, but you're moving really fast horizontally. But since the spaceship is moving, and you're inside of the spaceship moving at the same speed, then from your point of view, you're able to float inside of your spaceship just like if you were in an elevator falling in free fall. 
And this last question we asked, we've already answered, I'll just repeat it again. How does a spacecraft enter orbit and stay there? Well, spacecraft don't just go straight up uh, with a rocket. They go up and then they start to bend over and travel horizontally very, very fast. They need to reach a, reach a very fast speed, um, 25,000 miles an hour typically to reach orbit. And you need to reach that speed in order to be able to uh, avoid hitting the ground, essentially, is what we've been talking about. If you have a very slow speed, you're going to hit here. A medium speed, you're going to eventually hit down here. And if you reach orbital speed, you'll just keep on going because you'll be above the air and able to maintain this until you, know, until you decide to come back down again. That's how we reach orbit and stay there. Now you should understand basically what an orbit is. I want to kind of close this out because I talked a little bit about Copernicus and Kepler and Newton. And I want to make sure you understand that the idea of gravity is something that we even today don't totally understand. In 1915, you may have heard of this person. His name was Albert Einstein, and these are the years that he lived. He did a lot of work in science, but the thing he's mostly famous for that you probably heard about is the theory of relativity. There's actually two theories of relativity. This one was called the General Theory of Relativity, published in 1915. Basically, it is one of his most famous works because it totally uh, improves upon Newton's famous law of gravitation. So for hundreds of years, Newton's law of gravity was uh, taken to be truth. Einstein formulated a completely different theory that I'll talk about in detail in another lesson one day, but basically he made Newton's law of gravitation completely uh, much, much more accurate. It's a completely different way of thinking about gravity, again, for another lesson. Um, but in today's world, orbital motion that we've described using all of, all of the things in this lesson can be approximated pretty good using Newton's laws. So they're not, Newton's laws are not useless. They're easy to understand and they're easy to calculate. But for accuracy, when we're using real spacecraft, real orbits, like when we go and send spacecraft to Mars or Venus and we have to calculate how the orbit's going to work, we're always going to be using uh, Albert Einstein's general theory of, rel theory of relativity, which is basically Newton's, I'm sorry, Albert Einstein's theory of gravitation. Um, and that's basically what we're going to be using whenever we're doing anything that requires any kind of accuracy. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I hope you understand the basic idea of what an orbit is, how we get there, uh, and hopefully you understand that complicated sounding topics can be easy to understand if we just take it step by step, one idea at a time.